Okay, so we will um, continue with medications for seizures. Okay, so seizures activity occurs because there's an area in the brain, which is sometimes called a focus, that has an increase in electrical activity. It's very excitable. And because of these abnormal or uncontrolled nerve impulses in a certain area, the patient will develop um, seizures. Convulsions means there's muscle spasms associated with the seizure activity. So you don't always have to see the seizure. Some people have um, what are called absent seizures, where they don't actually have the convulsions or the tremor or of the muscles, but rather they kind of go blank and only what's ever happening isn't something that you can visually see. Depending on where that focus of abnormal impulses is, they could have symptoms that are only a partial seizure where maybe there's just, you know, one part of the body that's that develops convulsions as well. They might um, just get, you know, on their arm or something like that, the convulsions, or it can be a generalized seizure where with convulsions where the entire body is affected. Sometimes there can be an aura associated with the seizure where the person has a feeling that it's coming on, not always. And then they have the seizure and during the time of the seizure, they could have bowel or bladder incontinence. They certainly could fall and suffer other injuries because of the seizure. And then eventually the seizure activity stops and the patient um, is very, very sleepy. It's called the post ictal phase where after they've had the seizure the person might be almost obtunded or you can't really even wake them um, but definitely more tired and not completely with it until that wears off. At certain times for people having seizures they can have what's called status epilepticus which means the seizure activity is continuous and it won't stop unless there's some sort of intervention with medication in order to stop the abnormal activity. But usually it goes like this. There's a pre-syndrome, the seizure, and then the post-ictal phase. The key to medication management is to try to decrease the electrical activity in the hyperactive area. Um, so, and you want to do that without affecting normal nerve um, transmission, normal elect electricity. We don't want the person to be over sedated or comatose. We just want them to not have the abnormal electrical activity. So the first treatments which are not used for daily seizure control any longer, but could be used for status epilepticus, meaning the patient is having the continuous seizure. If I want to stop this continuous electrical activity, I could give them a, a medication that affects GABA receptors. So in order to understand seizures, we have to again think about the action potential. So we have a cell that is mostly negative when it's compared to the outside of the cell, the inside of the cell is mostly negative. Potassium is the largest cation inside the cell. Sodium is the largest um, cation outside the cell. If an electrical potential, if an action potential is going to take place, a channel opens that allows sodium to pour into the cell. That's what causes depolarization. Repolarization begins when potassium exits the cell. It's making the cell more positive that is the action potential. Medications that affect GABA receptors 
GABA receptors are located on the cell and they allow chloride, which is negative, to go inside the cell. So there's the receptors are on that channel. If there's something that acts like GABA on those receptors, then chloride can go into the cell and make it very, very negative. So it's very hard to depolarize. And that's what we want in terms of <clears throat> status epilepticus. These medications are not generally used, like I said, for seizures anymore. They are also used for general anesthesia. So you may recognize these medications used for different things. And they are often drugs of abuse as well. Um, so <clears throat> the first family of GABA receptor agonists or acting like GABA on the receptor to allow chloride to quickly go into the cell. Oops, somebody is asking a question. Oh, I thought someone was asking a question. Never mind. Um, is the barbiturates and phenobarbital is the medication. It's an old medication for seizures. They still give it to dogs and stuff if they have seizure disorder. Um, a barbiturate diprovan. Um, there are other, other similar um, barbiturates that are used for anesthesia. This medication could be given IM or IV. It is a tissue irritant or a vesicant, so you have to be careful with the IV site. And it can bring down heart rate, blood pressure, and lead to respiratory depression. Anyone that is on is receiving general anesthesia is generally intubated and placed on the ventilator because they're going to lose their drive to breathe. Um, Diprovan was the agent that was involved uh, in the in Michael Jackson's death because he had issues with sleeping, so he had an anesthesiologist actually give him Diprovan every night so he could sleep. But uh, obviously, that at that one point he got too much. Um, so that's the barbiturates. Benzodiazepines are medications that can be used for status epilepticus and diazepam can be used for that reason, which is Valium. Valium can certainly be used for other things as well, um, which we'll talk about later in the afternoon. Midazolam, which is Versed, is a benzodiazepine that's used as part of general anesthesia. Um, these medications, you know, some di some benzodiazepines are really only IV or IM, like midazolam. Diazepam can also be given by mouth. It does decrease electrical activity in the brain, which is why it can be used for status epilepticus. And it also does that so that you can perform a painful procedure on a patient. The other the other th thing that works with midazolam, especially when doing conscious sedation where the patient isn't completely asleep, it does lead to retrograde um, memory loss. So the patient won't remember. You could have a conversation with somebody who's on midazolam and they won't remember it later. Again, you have the risk of cardiac and respiratory arrest um, and sedation and dependency. So those medications in general are used for other things. Um, but could be used for status epilepticus. The traditional anti-epileptic drugs are ones that suppress the influx of sodium. So we'll draw that picture again of the cell that's mostly negative and has a lot of potassium inside. Um, sorry, and a little bit of sodium inside. There's a lot more sodium outside. In order to depolarize the cell, sodium has to go into the cell, makes it more positive. If we block sodium's entry into the cell, then we cannot depolarize. And we are hoping to do this not in the entire brain, but only in the area of increased electrical activity in that seizure focus in the brain. So these were the, instead of just putting the patient to sleep, essentially these were the, the next type of seizure medications that were developed, um, the traditional ones. And these drugs include phenytoin, carbamazepine, and valproic acid. These all suppress sodium influx 
to prevent depolarization of the cell. The next type of anti-seizure drugs are the non-traditional agents, and they can affect calcium's entry and are often the go-to anti-seizure medications now. There isn't a lot of information about them on ATI, so I also did not include that much information about them besides their names. For our lecture, probably over time, there'll be less information about these sodium ones and more about the calcium ones. You, we will talk about them again because they are also used in the management of bipolar. So the first sodium medication or traditional anti-epileptic drug we're going to talk about is phenytoin, which is dilantin. It can be given IV or PO. If it's given IV, it has uh, many incompatibilities and it cannot be mixed with dextrose. It must be mixed with saline. So if the patient has a maintenance IV running that's like D545, which has dextrose in it, that's their arm, then this medication would have to be disconnected and the IV flushed. And then we could give the medication, you know, the, the bag that has the mix of saline and phenytoin. We don't want them to share. We don't want the medication to share the tubing, like if you hung a secondary bag and did it that way. Inside the tubing where the dextrose is located, the patient could have precipitation of the dilantin, meaning it turns into sand, and it could lead to an embolus. Phenytoin is a vesicant, and so if it does come out of the vein, if the IV is in the subcutaneous tissue and the medication gets into the subcutaneous tissue, the patient can experience necrosis, so you have to be very careful about the IV line question yeah um it's kind not it's kind of off topic but either way um so when we say that stuff is not compatible through IV mm -hmm. does that also mean for central lines because I know with central lines you can have like the triple lumen and whatnot and run a whole bunch of stuff so is so does the same stuff apply um, it just depends on, that's a good question, it just depends on how the tubing is. So if, say you had a, in this scenario where we, where I kind of had, here's the maintenance fluid and then there's the dilantin, I, if I had a central line, and you'll have like the three things poking mm -hmm. out, I could run the D5, 4, 5, and 1 and run the dilantin and another and not mm -hmm. have to worry about them uh, mixing. Okay, so basic in general, when we run a central line, it doesn't. It's okay because it's going in an artery, or no, it's because so the central line is is going to end up in the superior vena cava, mm -hmm. but the central line itself. So you see the three things. It's usually like a triple or double lumen. Mm -hmm. yep. The central line itself. They, those ports empty in different spots Oh, okay. inside, so there'll be like three openings, and usually they're listed like it'll be proximal, meaning this first one, middle, and distal, oh, and so okay. they're, ac they're actually draining in a slightly different spot, so if you run the medicines together, it should be okay, and use, there are some medicines that they'll say use the distal port, so that you okay. don't have to worry, you can, it'll be further away. Okay, because I'm, I'm interning in the ER, and we've had, you know, quite a few people with a central line, and for the most part, they don't really care much, <laughs> like, yeah, all the yeah, stuff. Yeah, it's a different yeah. animal. Yeah. <laughs> you just okay. want to move them to someplace else. But, um, but say I had a central line, I still couldn't run it as a piggyback. I would have to just put it right. as a separate thing. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Sure. So phenytoin is one of those medications that has a very narrow therapeutic range. So most seizure medications, occasionally the patient will have a blood test to check that they're in the therapeutic window for the medicine. But only phenytoin has the really tight therapeutic range where you don't want to be above or below it. If you are below, so it's 10 to 20 micrograms per milliliter, 
if you're below that, then the patient is probably going to have breakthrough seizures because it's not enough to control their seizures. If you're above that, then you're at risk of toxicity, which for um, phenytoin can be you know, confusion, imbalance when walking, even up to being comatose. So you have to be careful that it's not too high. Um, in terms of side effects, there can be some overgrowth of the gums, that gingival hyperplasia. There might be some mild sedation, because although we're just trying to decrease depolarization of the seizure area, we could have some um, other nerves affected in the brain can have a decrease in blood pressure. So we have to be careful about position chains change. These are the adverse effects, so it could lead to severe or decreased heart rate and blood pressure, so that could get much lower. If the patient, especially if they have diabetes, you have to monitor their blood sugar because it can lead to hyperglycemia. And it has both of those skin reactions that we worry about, the toxic epidermal necrosis, which is the skin sloughing off, and Steven Johnson syndrome, which is when the patient gets you know, first they have upper respiratory infections and symptoms, and then they get the blisters. Um, alcohol can increase drug levels of phenytoin and increase the risk of toxicity, so should be avoided. Uh, phenytoin can decrease effectiveness of oral contraceptives, so the patient could get pregnant even though they were on oral contraceptives, and phenytoin is a pregnancy category D, and so you don't want them to get pregnant, so they'll need to use an alternative um, form of contraception. Uh, the next medication is carbamazepine, which is Tegretol. Um, this is a medication that is given with meals if you are get it, getting the sustained release, you cannot um, open it up or crush it. You have to swallow it whole. Um, there's an increased risk of toxicity if it's taken with grapefruit juice, so that's avoided. Um, you can get the Steven Johnson syndrome, syndrome and toxic epidermal necrosis with carbamazepine as well, just like with Dilantin. For some reason, there's a greater risk of this reaction in patients, in patients who are Asian and have this particular genetic mutation, which is more common in Asian people. So not all Asians, just Asians with this genetic mutation are more likely to have the skin reactions. Um, bone marrow suppression, which means you have to worry about the white blood cells, the red blood cells, and the platelets. And fluid retention. So if the patient has heart failure, and they're already having trouble managing fluid, then we might avoid using carbamazepine for these patients because it would put them at increased risk for an exacerbation of their heart failure. And then the last seizure medication is valproic acid, which is Depakote. And this medication can be given IV or PO. If you're going to take it PO, you can actually open the capsules and sprinkle it on food, um, which is unusual. You can't always do that. If you're taking the, the capsule and swallowing it, you should not chew it, the capsule itself and should not take with carbonated beverages or it can actually burn your mouth. It's uh, pregnancy category D as well. All the seizure medications are that we've talked about. Side effects, sedation, drowsiness, photosensitivity, which means they have to be careful about being in the sun. Um, it can cause bone marrow suppression, especially uh, affecting the platelets, so they can have increased bleeding time and can hurt the liver, um, which could eventually lead to hepatitis and pancreatitis. The other medications are non-traditional anti epileptic drugs. A good thing about these drugs is they also are pregnancy category C, so there isn't um, any demonstrated risk to the fetus, but there isn't any studies that show that it's not, you know, not going to be a problem, so it's less risk than the other ones, so it's a potential. Um, and you'll see, especially Lamotrigine, which is 
Lamictal is also used for mood stabilization, can be used um, for bipolar disorder. Um, so that's the end of this group of slides. I'm going to open up a matching quiz about side effects and adverse effects of the medications that you can take, and, and then um, we will reconvene at 11.05. So I'm going to open that up. So take that matching quiz. Open that. And then um, we'll meet, meet again at 11.05 and we'll go over the answers. Okay, so we'll go over that quiz. Um, doo -doo -doo, where are you, quiz? There you are. Let me just open that and then I'll be sure my screen is shared. Mm, not a lot of you completed that. Um, might be a good time to have a little check-in again on who's here and who isn't. I'm a little confused. I don't see any quiz. All I see is a bunch of drop-ins. Okay. Um, hold on a second. It was I'm called gonna... it was called medication side effects, and I no, opened, I... I opened it on screen. Yeah, I don't have it at all. I had the seizure medications, the perform the behavioral health medications, the everything was a download. I didn't see anything. Yeah, it's right here. Medication side effects. It's open for everyone. Some people took it. Everyone has the same screen. So I opened it in front of everybody to show you where it was. So I don't know what to say to you. Under. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Thank you, Beth. All right. Let me like two seconds. I can do this. Okay. Because I do want people to participate in everything, or you don't get attendance. I mean, that's the part that's hard for me is I can't see you, so I don't know. I mean, I understand what it's like to take a class where you can't see anybody and they're talking to you. I don't know how much everyone's giving their full attention at all times. I understand that that's difficult, but I don't know if you're not doing the things that we do to participate. I don't know if you're really here. I have no idea. So you have to do those things. If you have a question, I've been sitting at my computer this whole time, so I would be interesting. I mean, if you were here and you didn't hear anybody talk for 15 minutes, you might wonder why. I mean, you have to ask. Otherwise, I don't know if things are happening. Um, So I'm just looking at who's all here because I can't, I can't tell. It says 12. There's 15 in our class. I mean, I don't I don't know. And that includes me. So that means people are gone. Only nine people did the quiz. I mean, I have no idea. It's and as you can tell, it is slightly irritating. Like, I mean, I don't enjoy just talking to the wall for my health. You're supposed to be doing everything that is part of the class. Okay. Kale and Ryan. Here. Now, Keisha. Okay, so, so just, you know, just explain that she didn't see it. Hey Janice, I was just going to ask about you and Stephanie. Okay, so is Katie still here?
So I don't see any indication that Katie is still here. Let me just stop. Just want to be sure I'm not sharing my screen. I just want to look at who completed the quiz. Hello? Yeah. Hey, um, you know what I think it is? My computer is freezing constantly, so I think that may be part of my issue today. Um, do you mind if I just restart my computer and get back on? It should take me, like, maybe two minutes. Sure. Okay. Okay, so it looks like Stephanie still needs to do it, and I haven't heard anything from Katie. Um, and then I do need... Well, it's... it's Okay, it's there. It doesn't say quiz. It says medication matching. I, I don't open it separately for everybody. Um, it's the everyone's screen is the same. Um, so that's fine. You can log in, log out, and do that. And be sure, everybody, please be sure that you've also filled in the study sheet because um, I will be looking to see who completed it or not, and if you want full credit for attendance for the morning, you have to do all the activities for the morning, otherwise it doesn't count. Um, and there is going to be other activities that we're supposed to do to help with studying. Um, the next thing is going to be a math quiz. Oh, I'm so irritated. Okay. I'll get over it. That's okay. I just, if you can't see something and we're on a break where I said we're supposed to take a quiz, then let me know that you can't see it. Otherwise, it makes me worry that you were, you kind of dropped off and weren't really paying attention or just waiting for us to start up again. Um, I just want us all to be together on this so that we can be successful on the test. I mean, that's what these activities are for. Um, so the next activity we're going to do is a math um, test. Let me just open it. Okay, so... Um, I'm back. Okay, so what we're doing now, I'm going to share, let me just be sure my screen is okay, because then I'm going to share what we're doing. It's a math thing, and people still get math problems or questions wrong, so it's good to practice. Okay. So if you look here, neuromath, it's just three math questions. So I'll give you five minutes, like 11.15. At 11.20, we'll come back and um, go over the answers. So it's the neuromath. So this is the matching for the side adverse effects. Uh, levodopa carbidopa is that harmless darkening of urine and sweat. Selegiline is the insomnia. It's the worst insomnia um, of all the medications, and so it must be taken before noon. Denazepil, or sorry, um, denapazil is... The black tarry stools, there's an increased risk of GI bleed, especially, um, this is especially the, a problem um, if the patient is taking NSAIDs at the same time. And additionally, the other issue um, is a potential for bradycardia that could lead to syncope. Mamantine uh, is the increased confusion. Midazolam is the benzodiazepine that is not used for status epilepticus, but it is used um, as part of conscious sedation or general anesthesia, and it causes retrograde memory loss. Phenytoin um, is the hyperglycemia, especially if the patient is diabetic. 
Carbamazepine is fluid retention, especially an issue if the patient has congestive heart failure, and it might be a reason not to use that one. Valproic acid can cause hepatitis or pancreatitis. Um, and that's so those are the answers to that quiz. I don't know if anyone had any questions about that one before we look at the math. to the math one here. So these are very similar to the medication questions that we will have. The patient is to receive a bolus of anti-seizure medication, phenytoin, which happens um, if someone is on this medication a lot and then they miss a couple doses and they need to get into the therapeutic window a little bit quicker. So they're getting a gram of phenytoin that's mixed into 50 milliliters of what would have to be normal saline, not dextrose. And it's supposed to be given over 30 minutes. So we are just concerned about the 50 milliliters, not the gram. And 50 milliliters, um, there's thir two 30 minutes um, segments in an hour, so it's 50 times 2 gets you 100 milliliters per hour. Um, patients to receive 500 milliliters of normal saline over the next four hours, and the drop factor is 15 drops per milliliter, and you do have to round it to the nearest whole number because you can't um, give a portion of a drop. So it's 500 divided by 4 gives you how many milliliters per hour, and then you would have to convert hours to minutes, and then convert um, the milliliters to drops. Did, any, did everyone get that correct? Does anyone have a question about the drop? No, I got number two right. Okay. Okay, that was good. So the answer to the drop factor one was 31. Did you get that right, Aaliyah? Did that work okay? Okay. And then the last one is the patient is receiving 200 milligrams of phenytoin three times a day. Um, so we need to, to figure out how many capsules they need. Each, each pill is 100 milligrams, so they're taking... Um, two of those tablets three times a day, which is so that's six pills a day. And if they're going to take it for a month, then it's 30 times six, which is 180. And those are similar questions that we might have. Um, so hopefully that those went okay. Does anybody have any questions about those, um, those math questions before we start behavior health medicine? Because that is where we will go to now. Oop, not the announcements, though. So the next group of medications to talk about are the behavioral health medications. Okay, any idea how many math questions are usually on the ATI exam at the end? That is a good question. I have never been able to see the final ATI. I don't think it's as many as we have on our tests, maybe one or two. Um, but I don't, I don't know for sure, unfortunately. That is a good question. They're very private about those exams. So I don't even know, and they just changed it again recently, so I'm not sure. Unfortunately, all right, sure. So the other, the last part of the neuro medications that we're going to talk about are the medications that are used for behavior or health problems, such as depression, anxiety, um, schizophrenia, ADD, all those types of um, diagnoses that people can have. And the theory is that if you have a diagnosis of a behavior or health problem, 
that isn't related to a situation, you know, a current situation in your life that might, so you might have some of these things as a temp, on a temporary basis, that the reason you have the, the issue is because of a neurotransmitter imbalance. And so if we alter the amount of the neurotransmitter that is available, then you will feel better. And that this is this theory or this using medications to help behavioral health problems means that people who have behavioral health problems, they're, it, they're just born with those things. And so we just, for whatever reason, the person has less of a required neurotransmitter, and so we can treat those things with medications. Um, so the first type of disorder we're gonna talk about is anxiety. And all of these um, diagnoses have a range of symptoms. You know, somebody might never feel anxious, you might feel a small amount of anxiety, which is good in some cases because it can it can be what spurs you on to do important activities. You know, like if you have anxiety about a test, a small amount of anxiety might help you to spend time and focus on studying for that test. Uh, it could be that a certain situation is leading to increased anxiety for you. Um, but oftentimes people who actually experience anxiety because of some kind of change in their brain chemistry just feel this uneasiness and apprehension and they can't actually tell you exactly what's making them feel that way. So the spectrum is no symptoms all the way up to psychosis. I mean, some people can have anxiety so bad that they have a separation from reality. Um, that's obviously not very common. And some people with anxiety can also have intermittent panic attacks where they feel, you know, chest pain, shortness of breath, elevated respiratory rate, and they can't even really tell you why they have that feeling. They just get it. There are many types of anxiety disorders. Um, generalized anxiety disorder is what we're talking about when we're talking about the treatments. Mo a lot of people or most people that experience insomnia or sorry anxiety will also experience insomnia as part of their symptoms and so there are, those two things are usually associated the definition of insomnia is that the patient is unable to fall asleep or if they do fall asleep they are unable to remain asleep and sleep is essential especially stage four sleep, which allows for restoration and healing of just normal tissue wear and tear throughout the day. And stage five sleep, which is REM sleep when you dream, because that's how partially how memories are formed in your brain. So that's why people always say, you shouldn't pull an all-nighter before an exam because you're actually decreasing your brain's ability to process new information without sleeping. Um, so that's why it's best to study every day, then you're more likely to remember that information. And there, of course, just situational insomnia, some insomnia that is associated with anxiety disorder and rebound anxiety or insomnia means that the patient has been using medication for their insomnia, which has helped their sleep. And then they decide they stop the medication. And in those cases, people can develop rebound insomnia. So in the beginning, the treatment for anxiety and the insomnia that goes with anxiety was really all about depressing the central nervous system. So if you are anxious and your central nervous system is always revved up, then if we give you medications that slow that down, you will feel better. And so the basis of treatment was the benzodiazepams, which we talked about you know, at higher doses IV, we could use to arrest a seizure like diazepam or Medalazam, which is Versed, we could use as part of conscious sedation or general anesthesia. Benzodiazepams were the mainstay of treatment for anxiety and insomnia in the past. 
you will still see people that are on benzodiazepams for anxiety, um, especially with panic attacks or when their anxiety, when they feel the anxiety is out of control, that they might take a benzodiazepam on a PRN basis or as needed. The way anxiety is treated now is a combination of talk therapy and trying to make some behavior changes and actually antidepressants. And then there are another whole group of medications that are non-benzodiazepams that are used for sleep. So you'll see a lot of people kind of shy away now from using benzodiazepines on a regular basis for people with anxiety because they are habit forming. Can people use um, Xanax for sleep? Yeah, so that is in the same family um, or similar family to the benzodiazepines. It's a shorter acting one, um, the Xanax. So it is sometimes people like to use it for sleep because it starts to work really fast so the patient falls asleep, especially if they don't have the trouble with remaining asleep. It might help them get to sleep, but when they stop doing it, they will probably have rebound insomnia. But it's a little bit safer to do something like Xanax just because it's such a short-acting medication. Um, than if you did lorazepam, which is Ativan, which is what we're going to talk about next. Okay. Sure. So lorazepam or Ativan is a GABA receptor agonist, and we talked about that when we talked about seizure medications. And that means it's opening those chloride channels to allow chloride to get into the cell, and it makes it harder to depolarize the cell. So this medication could be given PO, and you'll probably see this when you're working as a nurse, or even now if, if you're working um, in like nursing homes or um, working as a CNA or something, that patients sometimes will have PRN, lorazepam, or Ativan on their medication administration record as like a standing order for sleep or anxiety, or it is usually older people that have been prescribed these medications on a regular basis. So if the person would actually like to come off of the medications during their hospitalization is not the time to do it. They have to be weaned from them. And so hopefully them working with their provider might change their use of that medicine. Um, so the medication you can give it IV for people that are definitely very uh, restless and agitated. Um, however, you do need to worry about the respiratory depression and the CNS depression. So we should expect some degree of drowsiness and sedation. Oh, so Nicole mentions that she's seen it given for detox. Yes, because the risk in detox or the risk for alcohol withdrawal is something called delirium tremens, which means the patient develops seizures or could develop status epilepticus. So while the patient is withdrawing from the alcohol, you can give scheduled lorazepam based on their, how, you know, their CWA scale or how many symptoms they have of withdrawal. And the, what you're trying to do is as they're physically withdrawing from the alcohol, you're trying to prevent the seizures that could occur with that withdrawal because people have died from status epilepticus from withdrawal or what has the name delirium tremens, which I don't know how it got that name sent. But so that is very common to use to use that as part of a CWA scale, which is, you know, watching for alcohol withdrawal or detoxification. Very common to use it for that. I had a quick question. You said you have to be weaned off from it, and then um, if you don't, what happens? The person feels really sick, so they will feel um, sweaty, they'll have a headache, they might um, have a rebound in the amount of anxiety they have, they could have like hypertension and stuff, so they feel, they feel ill, especially if they're used to taking it on a daily basis for a long time. It can take one to two weeks to act to actually effectively withdraw from the medicine so that they don't experience side effects. So what I noticed, a lot of times people will give, you know, elderly 
confused patients lorazepam or some kind of sedating medication to get them to to stop being agitated and and that but you do really run the risk of respiratory depression so you have to check on them frequently to be sure that they're breathing effectively um, and when you're giving it IV some of those effects can be more severe especially in the elderly like disorientation or um, hypotension or blurred vision um, there is a risk of misuse and dependence and you have to be careful if the patient has liver disease because they're at an increased rate risk of toxicity um, and then because it can blur vision you have to be careful about using it with glaucoma or impaired brain function it can make that worse um, so you can use any of those benzodiazepams for insomnia as well but there is a risk of rebound insomnia so when people kind of switched away from the benzodiazepams because they're so habit forming and tried to treat anxiety instead with antidepressants and there was this whole opening for medications that could potentially help with sleep that weren't benzodiazepams or strong sedatives and so our prototype is Zolpidem which is Ambien there's some others are listed there um, and Ambien is for short-term insomnia management it works rapidly so it's, it works the best for people who have trouble falling asleep not necessarily the people that have trouble staying asleep however you do develop rebound insomnia after you've been using it for a couple of days and there are now black box warnings on Zolpidem or Ambien because of some of its neuropsychiatric effects so there are people that started binge eating you know eating while they're sleeping sleepwalking sleep driving um, there was even a person that used the fact that they were on Ambien as a they had killed their partner while they were supposedly in one of these like neuropsychiatric like half awake half asleep states and they did get get off of that murder charge by using with that defense so there is warnings on those medications um, not to give anyone any ideas about how to get rid of their partner or whatever but um, so you have to be careful there are over-the-counter things that you can use for sleep you know some people will talk about soon respiratory medications and antihistamines like diphenhydramine which is Benadryl can be um, somewhat helpful due to its side effect of sedation you can use over-the-counter melatonin melatonin is a hormone that is supposed to help with sleep-wake cycles and suppose if you increase melatonin then that should increase your ability to sleep at night although even those medications especially melatonin can have a point where they no longer are very effective melatonin is usually most effective for three to six months and then after that you kind of have to increase the dose but you can only go so far with it so it's not it's best to try to do other things to manage sleep what are like sleep hygiene things like not drinking a lot of fluids or caffeine before bed not keeping the lights on keeping bright lights away from your eyes when you're trying to go to bed like looking at your phone and things like that because you you can change your body's interpretation of day and night when you look at bright screens um, if you're having trouble sleeping you should leave your bed and try to do something else for a little bit and then return later um, so there's other things that people can do to try to enhance sleep which are probably better for them than taking the medications and so we'll just you, start oh go ahead can you mix like the like the over-the-counter is with the medication to kind of balance it out uh if that's no because then you're gonna end up instead of balancing it you're gonna have that additive effect and so the person is more likely to experience like respiratory depression or um, trouble waking up in the morning so that's the other thing is people don't always feel well rested when they wake up mm, okay or, so we'll start with depression or at least what the definition of depression is before we go to our lunch 
the app called Flux. Oh, that's interesting, Scott. I have never heard of that. That reduces the blue light displayed on your computer or phone. That would be very helpful because the brightness um, really does mess with your circadian rhythm. Your your brain interprets that as it being still daytime. They're blue. Oh, blue light glasses. Are they cute? That's cool. Yeah, because I noticed that, and I try not to look at my compu my phone before I lay down. It's hard sometimes because you're just sort of drawn to it, but that does can really affect your ability to fall asleep. So depression is more than just sadness. Again, it's a range of symptoms from no depression to having um, some feelings of sadness that are related to a situation or a particular day isn't going well. Some people can have an increase in depression that's situational, which they might actually treat, like for grief responses and things like that. Um, then, of course, there are people that experience depression all the time, and they might not be able to say exactly why that occurs, all the way to people having such bad depression that they um, kind of have a split from reality and start to develop psychotic symptoms. So the definition of depression is, an, is at least two, or sorry, at least five of the following symptoms for five, or ugh, five of the following sy symptoms for two weeks you have to have in order to meet the official psychiatric definition of depression. And so it should be sort of interfering with your ability to take care of yourself, you know, manage school or work, um, those kinds of, of issues. The thought is that depression is related to an imbalance of several neurotransmitters in your body. So dopamine, um, which helps with motivation and memory, um, and norepinephrine, which is important for concentration, um, feelings of certainty, and serotonin, which is a pleasure, relaxation, things like that. So if you have a neurotransmitter, dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin, if they're in balance, then your mood should be relatively stable. You should be able to care for yourself, have good attention and the ability to remember things and have enough, you know, pleasure and joy in your daily activities. So the thought has always been for depression is that we need to alter these neurotransmitters. And typically our medications that we take, they might affect one of those or several of those neurotransmitters, but they, the typical action is changing reuptake. So we have that one nerve and then the second nerve that has receptors and a neurotransmitter is released to interact with the receptors and then after what we after that we have to clear the synapse for the next time we need you know for the next time the nerve gets activated so either it's an enzyme that clears that area or neurotransmitter is recycled in an activity called reuptake and that is how medications for depression usually work they, e they either stop reuptake so that the neurotransmitter stays in the synapse or they block the enzyme that breaks down the neurotransmitter so again the neurotransmitter stays in the synapse. You're trying to increase the availability of those neurotransmitters. So the first group of antidepressants um, were called tricyclic antidepressants. They're called tricyclic because of what their chemical structure looks like. And some of these medications you might see used for other things. Sometimes they're used for sleep. I've seen amitriptyline used for migraines, for um, <clears throat> other neuropathies. Amipramine is our prototype medication. That was the first one that was developed. So this medication is going to block reuptake of both serotonin and norepinephrine. 
it can take at least two weeks to work um, because we're blocking um, norepinephrine we can have some or anticholinergic or sympathetic nervous system type of side effects because we're increasing that so dry mouth constipation difficulty urinating um, things of that nature people who are diabetic if they start taking amipramine may notice an increase in sweating which is what diaphoresis is um, all antidepressants and tricyclics are included all antidepressants increase the risk of suicidal ideation especially when you're first starting it and especially if you're a teenager or young adult and so I don't know they're not really sure why that is if maybe there's a lag like you starting to take a medication and your ability to concentrate and your motivation increases before your actual feelings of pleasure increase so maybe it's just easier to get the energy to carry out your plan I'm not sure exactly what the issue is but that's always a risk and with tricyclic antidepressants that's a bigger risk because this is a medication with OD potential if you take too much um, amipramine you can develop cardiac dysrhythmias and a, um, a heart attack which could ultimately kill the patient so you have to be careful when they're first starting um, kidney or liver impairment increases the risk of toxicity so increases the risk of issues with the patient's heart which is what we're most worried about um, the other thing that can happen is a poss the possibility of that serotonin syndrome we talked about that I added some syllables in there we talked about that um, with the medication that we were using for um, um, for migraine headaches and we talked about the tryptans which are serotonin agonists that if we had too many medications that we used together that affected serotonin that we could develop you know problems with fevers change of bowel habits hypertension um, headaches and seizures and that's again because we're manipulating serotonin we have to be careful if we add other medications that also manipulate serotonin so that we don't cause a problem so we'll stop here um, it's 1150 and come back at 1 o'clock after lunch so I will um, we'll start then